preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is John Ruskay. Again, as Director of Education, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 92nd Street Y and to this second evening of our series, Our Country and Our Culture. Again, let me remind you that this series, initially announced as a three-part series, has been extended. The series continues next Thursday evening with Irving Howe and Leon Wieseltier, and will conclude on Thursday evening, January 12, when William Phillips, the editor of Partisan Review from 1937 to the present, and one of the formulators of the initial symposium, will participate with Professor Daniel Bell of Harvard. This evening, following the initial presentations by our, by our speakers and the conversation on stage conducted by our moderator, Walter Goodman, members of the audience will be able to submit written questions on the index cards which you received as you entered the hall. Please pass your questions to the center aisles. In about an hour, ushers will collect the cards and bring them backstage for presentation. Our first speaker this evening will be author, philosopher, and teacher, Dr. William Barrett. A native, native New Yorker, William Barrett received his PhD from Columbia University. For 29 years, Dr. Barrett was professor of philosophy at New York University, where he is now professor emeritus. In 1982, he was named distinguished professor of philosophy at Pace University. Dr. Barrett, while residing in the academy, has always been committed to intimately linking the study of philosophy with the actual realities of our time. He served as editor of Partisan Review from 1945 to 1954 and as literary critic for the Atlantic Monthly from 1960 to 1964. He is the author of numerous books and articles which include Irrational Man, which helped introduce existentialism to American readers, Time of Need, an Analysis of Modern Art, The Illusion of Technique, which probes the philosophic questions posed by a technical civilization, and The Truance, which focuses on New York intellectual life post-World War II. William Barrett, one of the original participants in the 1952 symposium, which serves as the point of departure for this series, will be joined this evening by Hilton Kramer, one of America's most distinguished critics. Mr. Kramer received his undergraduate education at Syracuse University and has pursued graduate studies at Columbia University, Harvard, and the New School. He has served on the faculties of Indiana University, Bennington College, the University of Colorado, Yale University, and lectures widely at university and museums throughout the country. Hilton Kramer published his first works of literary criticism in 1950 and art criticism in 1953. He has contributed to numerous journals, including Partisan Review, Commentary, The New York Review of Books, The New Republic, and The Hudson Review. The editor of Arts Magazine from 1955 to 1961, art critic for The Nation from 1962 to 1963, Associate Editor, Art Critic, and then Book Critic for the New Leader, Hilton Kramer joined the staff of the New York Times as Art News Editor in 1965. After serving for a year as the Times Cultural Editor, he was named Chief Art Critic in 1973, a position he held with rare distinction until 1982 when he resigned to establish and serve as the first editor of the new criterion. The author of The Age of the Avant-Garde, Hilton Kramer's current book projects include The Revenge of the Philistines, a collection of art criticism from the years 1972 to 1982, and Abstract Art, a Cultural History, both to be published by Forrest Strauss. We are honored to have William Barrett and Hilton Kramer with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our series moderator, Walter Goodman, and William Barrett, and Hilton Kramer.
Good evening. Welcome to the second in our series of encounters hearkening back to the 1952-53 Partisan Review Symposium, Our Country and Our Culture. I feel I'm in a position of uh, one of those radio announcers at Soaps who uh, has to remind people of what happened last week. You know, last week we left the intellectual community divided over the effects of mass culture and somewhat skeptical about the role of the intellectual in America. One of the words brooded about last week was alienation. Although, as I think of it, I think I'm the only one who brooded it, and since I wasn't talking into the microphone, nobody could hear me anyway. <laughs> but with or without that word, Christopher Lash argued that the worker is alienated from his workplace by the structure and the technology of our big corporations. And Leslie Fiedler seemed to be arguing that intellectuals as a class, with the exception of Mr. Fiedler, were alienated from America. <laughs> or maybe it was that Americans were alienated from the intellectuals. In either case, Mr. Fiedler was on the side of the non-intellectuals, I think. <laughs> Our guest this evening, I suspect, may agree that there is a division between America's intellectuals and America, but I don't think that they will frame it in the way that Mr. Fiedler did. In his response to the original Partisan Review Symposium, William Barrett began with a brief apologia for alienation because he saw the period, as many on the political left would come to see it, as one of widespread drift to conformism. He wrote, let me find what he wrote. The first thing we know, the intellectuals, in the course of whipping up their enthusiasm for America, begin to show some of the appalling traits of conformism. At the moment, for example, the most influential doctrine in literary criticism in this country boils down to a defense or rediscovery of bourgeois values, the values of stability, material possessions, family, social manners, and so on. <laughs> now, all of these things are very much needed in America, and I am pleased to see them now seriously advanced by certain critics. But I grow very uneasy at the point where this critical message stops, and when I see the names of Pascal and Tolstoy invoked in this defense of bourgeois values, I can't help suspecting that the spiritual anguish of these men is being very conveniently forgotten. Isn't this, after all, what a lot of Americans would like to believe? that all those long centuries of mankind's spiritual struggle in the past become unnecessary in the face of the extrovert and technological intelligence that can possess and manipulate material goods. Mr. Barrett expressed concern, in particular, over the permeation of our culture by a rigidified form of Freudianism, which perhaps seemed more powerful in the 50s than it does today, and he also noted the emergence in 1952 of neoconservatism, the influence of which I trust we shall hear more about this evening since both Mr. Barrett and Mr. Kramer willy-nilly seem to bear this label. But mainly Mr. Barrett drew attention in, <laughs> in the original symposium to what he called streamlined mass journalism. In his words, a mass art par excellence. He wrote on the next page, In a journalistic civilization like ours, journalism takes over everything, novels, plays, movies, which become increasingly more topical, and eventually everybody's mind. I find it simply uncanny how the minds of a good many intellectuals I know are completely permeated by journalism beyond their suspicions of it. Mr. Barrett warned against this journalism that makes us all more superficial, even as it makes us more knowledgeable, and he concluded on a somewhat dire note. I should like to see America succeed in its own terms so that it might fail totally. Out of that total failure might come something greater than man has ever known, but certainly not before. Well, perhaps he will tell us this evening whether in the past 30 years America has failed in the right way. <laughs> will? Okay. I'll go over there. Uh, 
And, and that was rather puzzling. Some of it I agreed with, and some of it was very remote and distant. Uh, I don't know how to put it together at the moment, but. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? <laughs> You'd better. <laughs> Look. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me, I think, for the purpose of you, I don't know what transpired at the last session, but uh, I, I think maybe we might raise the question again and start with a, an introit in the accepted manner of you go back and look where this whole thing started from. I mean, think of the original symposium, which, oh, and I really had a little wine for dinner, but I'm very sober. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's, um, now, in 1952, this symposium was launched, and it's, it's been taken up since, uh, not only here this series, and uh, very intelligently, I think, from its planning, but elsewhere, our country and our culture. And I don't want to say who had the idea of it because that's going to launch a squabble between the two former editors, Phillips and Rav, and I'm sick and tired of their bickering. <laughs> but in any case, I remember that in 1952, I was easing my way out of the Partisan Review for a variety of reasons which might be interesting if you care to probe me uh, later in the discussion. Uh, and I, I felt this was rather a tepid kind of, of uh, symposium. Uh, it didn't go to the root of the matter, I thought, at the time. But I noticed from what uh, Mr. Gooden uh, read that I probably, and I sh should really tell you, I've become a different, I hope, person in, after all, it's, it's 52, it's 30 years. I mean, you're supposed to go somewhere in 30 years. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> 52, it's rather interesting. I look back, I found it impossible to read my own contribution. I was very grateful to Mr. Goodman reading those <clears throat> treasured bits of prose <laughs> loud, but I couldn't do it myself. <clears throat> and, uh, but I could read the statement, and I remembered it, the occasion. Now, in 52, <coughs> suddenly the, uh, the American intellectuals, at least we always assume when we say the American intellectuals, it's New York intellectuals who are saying that for the rest of the intellectuals of the country. <laughs> Thus it has always been, and I gather as far as the, the why intends, thus it will always be. <laughs> But it was a benevolent mood that they had for the moment toward uh, uh, the United States of America. And on the face of it now, I'm trying to remember, it's hard to put together exactly what at that moment motivated them to go ahead and start this symposium, in which in effect they said, America is now the main resource of the civilized world, both politically and culturally, I mean, Europe can no longer be relied on as a, as a deep resource and so on, spiritually or politically, and we are the bearers of the Western world and its message. And uh, that, that was rather an uncanny thing. Now, I, I look back and read the statement, I thought, yes, and in about, if you consider what the Partisan Review intellectuals as representing left, representative or uh, not perhaps representative, but advanced intellectual, left-wing intellectuals stood for, this was really rather a striking thing. Now, what went into it? Well, for one thing, there had been World War II, which, which left a certain kind of sense of benign unity for the nation. You know, uh, some years ago, I served at West Point they, it came about this way, and it rather shows, if some of you are interested, the ironies of history. One of the spin-offs of the Vietnam War 
was the fact that West Point decided it should have a philosophy course and that it would be required. Why? Because they suddenly found that officers in the field had to face moral problems. You see, the Vietnam War was really the first war in which the people were thoroughly divided on the whole issue of the war. And there were a good many of personal consultations that a lieutenant might have to take with his troops and so on. And the army is not quite <laughs> so awful as some of you think. They have a human face, too. Anyway, so they set about, as the army does, instigating. Notice I use instigate. <laughs> I sh we should say, really, initiating. But <laughs> you should have seen the syllabus they made. They instigated a, a course in the introduction to philosophy. And of course, it was awful. I mean, <laughs> they asked me up, and uh, NYU had gratuitously resigned me at this point, so I went up here. And my, uh, uh, my purpose was to help them uh, reform this course. Given a, they had a course which would have taken, you know, any, any college instructor couldn't help it. This is a two year course, you know, they'd run through the books and the the ar army is so conscientious that it's always mucking up things. It ran through all the textbooks and thought we'll put in some of this, some of this, and that. But the point was, in discussing the course with the, some of the officers who were not unintelligent and not illiberal. <laughs> incidentally, I think it was when I was at West Point, I felt my greatest despair at the future of America. Because there I was in a nest of doves. Uh, all right, that's a parenthetical <laughs> remark. We'll go back. But <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, here, here's this course, and, the, and one officer blandly came to me. He says, yes, but after all, you know, the Second World War was the last holy war. Consider that. This is what this laborious, uh, anecdote of mine leads up to the Second World War was the last holy war, said by a very saddened military person. Now it was, actually. Translate that in another way. The Second World War was the last time in which there was a national unity in this country. By 1952, this still existed. The Korean War hadn't quite busted wide open. Uh, the arms race had begun, but it was not so terrible. The Russians had found the bomb in 1948, and uh, as my friend, the demonic editor of Partisan View, Philip Rob, used to rant coming to the office, it was traitors like Fuchs and so on that made sure they got it so soon. They would have gotten it in any case. But in any case, in 1952, the Russians had the bomb, but they were not yet serious competitors. The arms race buildup hadn't started. So there was a kind of blandness. For some reason, the Korean War hadn't really shocked or at least galvanized the intellectuals of that period. So they could feel, at this particular moment in time, a certain mood of benevolence and approbation for the United States. After all, it had a persisting uh, political and social stability. It was still here. You could rely on it. And then the, they had to pass, again, to some cultural accolades for the country. Uh, and looking back now, it's rather ironical to me. A good many of the American intellectuals had been earning their cultural and professional bread by writing about American culture. They'd been writing very serious and appreciative studies of Henry James, Melville, uh, Hawthorne, Twain, and so on. And then suddenly they should be ready to, yes ma'am, tip their hat was rather ironical. It's about time. Because it, suddenly, you know, the United States after they'd been writing that, it appeared to them as a country which wasn't a cultural blank in the past. 
It wasn't, they, they didn't have to present this desolate picture of a country which was empty of culture in comparison with Europe. Of course, it didn't have the years of Europe, but in any case, it was an acknowledgement <laughs> long due of the fact that where they'd been earning their cultural bread, these particular intellectuals and writers, credit where credit is due. And if the, the United States of the past had provided a number of engaging and profound and significant figures, like the ones that had been in Melville and Henry James and so on, then perhaps there was no reason to believe that there wasn't a, an, an open and flowing and active future here in culture possible. The, the United States was not bound to be a cultural desert. And, you know, a lot of the early thing, uh, discussions of uh, writers and prophets, literary prophets, let's say before the First World War, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot kept quiet, but he moved there and so on. They all felt that this was a bizarre and empty kind of culture, a country for a, a, a poet or creative writer to pursue his future in. Now in 1952, the editors of Partisan Review, the intellectuals they represented, felt otherwise. And I think in that respect, they, they were significantly right. All right, that's the first point here. Uh, but they were also willing, and this is something to grant. Intellectuals, by the way, are not very generous. When they concede something, they usually granted in a kind of minimal, excuse the expression, snide way. <laughs> like, they're willing to grant that democracy in America was a continu continuing institutional fact of society here, and it was real. It was not just a mask for capitalism. You see, now, for, because this is um, an issue which we'll probably come back to in the discussion, and I'll tip you off here. Uh, <clears throat> that it was, an, you know, the notion that suddenly American, American democracy was real. There was a democratic government. All the totalitarianisms that had appeared elsewhere in the globe, America had plotted on in a slap-happy way. Scandals here, scandals there, but that's the way of a democracy and so on. This was real, and it was worth taking, uh, taking seriously. Imagine, these grown men were saying, we can't just go around saying they're just trying to deceive us. It's those big corporations and those capitalists who are pretending we got something special here called democracy, but it's just a facade. No, democracy wasn't just a facade, and that was real. Of course, they didn't go to the further point. That took some years later, among some of the intellectuals of this group. Um, to raise this question historically, which I put to you, and which may get kicked around tonight, is the connection between capitalism and a liberal society not more intrinsic than we were willing to believe? That is to say, if we look at history, a free liberal society emerges with the emergence of capitalism. And where capitalism is oppressed or suppressed or, or vanishes, you find the society drifting into a form of totalitarianism. In other case, is it not, in other words, is it not the case that perhaps there is an intrinsic and essential connection between ca the capitalist form of economy, call it the economy of free choice, and a liberal society generally. Okay, that's, that was, <clears throat> and they, had, they didn't raise that. That was, that was still in the future. Remember, in 1952, Stalin was still alive. He was not to die until 1956. And there was always among us radicals. The time, 53, the, 53, yeah. Among us? Did somebody say we? 53. <laughs> St he died in 53. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, thank you very much. 
Abby Casey was still alive when this, so my point holds. It wasn't that, how the hell did he, he die? <laughs> so, I'm such a, anyway, as I was saying, before I was so very helpfully interrupted, there was always the lingering feeling, especially for our generation, we grew up as a New York radical group, feeling that Stalin had snatched the revolution. No way. But there was still, so long as it was there, they could never raise the question, you know, whether if, if he hadn't been there, the revolution would have gone in a more liberal manner. No. Uh, and that would po probably be something which, because this has been the persisting problem of what I would call the political intelligentsia in the United States since, to make up its mind about whether the progress toward totalitarianism was not absolutely inherent in the kind of socialist institutions which the Russian Revolution, or should I say the Russian Pooch, since it wasn't a revolution, that was brought about. All right. Now, one deep fear that the, and I, Mr. Goodwin, I'll be through in a moment, uh, was that the editors of, of partisan we had was about mass culture. Now, I've been thinking back independently of, the symp of that symposium and as con contributors and so on. 1952, you remember, television was just beginning. Now, think of it independently of, of this symposium and other things. Television, in 52, from 52 to the present, It's, it's, it's a mass phenomenon that's unparalleled in the history of human society and human culture. The degree in which it saturates all modes of communication, human groups and human societies. Now, they raise the question, what will be the cultural effects of this? At the moment, we can only wait and see and pick, pick to pieces here and there. Uh, I can say as a former teaching professor that one thing I can say is that it's been deleterious on the reading habits of students and I think of other people in general. It's <clears throat> been one more powerful impetus against the power of the written word. Um, people get used to having a visual kind of vividness and my own thing, and I probably disagree here, we raised a little ruckus about it at dinner with Hilton Kramer. I believe even this began with the movies, the disposition to think that movies had a profound message. Whereas in fact, they you really usually just had a, an appalling, when they were good, sentimental and nice <laughs> message. All right, well let's, I'm, I'm trying to throw out some controversial things here. And the, now, you see, I'm, I'll break down now, and, and with this I will uh, remove myself from your ken. That the, 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 this, as I was thinking about this, the, there are two questions here, or two levels of the question about our country and our culture. First, there is the question which invokes the whole of modern civilization, which, the question which questions modern civilization as such whether that's viable. I happen not to think it is. I mean, one of the awful things I think about television is now, uh, the, the so-called television, I will forget it. <laughs> I don't, Cable television, that was the word I was groping for. Uh, cable te television is just, you know, you come into somebody's house, you know, and they turn on cable, and they're looking at it. And then you look at this, and you say, holy smoke, these are, well, these happen to be middle class citizens. And then I just said to myself, it's clear. A civilization which is 
gone that way can't survive. It's going to break down. It's going to come apart. There is some, no moral gumption standards. All right, that's what. The, now, there's a question of, of you see, of, of, of modern civilization is the problem. And there is the peculiar question, which is very active now. The United States is a distinct political entity. I am very dubious about modern, modern civilization in certain large segments of it. But I, I am for the United States as a distinct political entity. So now, all right, the final point I have to make, the difference between our situation now and 1952, and that's the fact that the Cold War has escalated and the major problem confront, or at least the major problem which it hits so many people, is the question of nuclear arms and where we're going to go. And that, that is intimately linked with the question, you see, of the moral background and the moral situation of the of the Western world. Look, I mean, all these protests you see in, in France, in Germany, and elsewhere in England, too, about the installation of bonds now, it just occurs to me. That is uh, during a period in which these countries have been relatively prosperous. What will happen to the Western alliance when suddenly there is a deep recession, as there is bound to be in a number of years. In other words, when they're leveled a material prosperity, you have, in other words, these, these German protesters, and Western Germany has known a degree of prosperity which has really been unusual over the years. If there is any serious recession, I look for a greater Defection. So our situation, I'm presenting the, the problems as I see it. Our situation is ominous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We've had an answer to the question. Civilization has failed and America is succeeding. I think. No, not quite no. so. Right. Uh, just to remind you of the rules of the occasion, uh, Hilton Kramer will speak, and then there'll be a conversation, and then we welcome uh, your questions. Hilton. My time is about right. What? Thank you. I think that it was an excellent idea to base a discussion or a series of discussions on the symposium on our country and our culture that appeared in Partisan Review in 1952, since um, that symposium clearly reflected a, uh, a historical turning point in the relationship of American intellectuals to the political ethos of their own country. I not only th think it is uh, an excellent idea to explore the issues raised by the original Partisan Review Symposium, but I thought it was an excellent idea when it was first done in February of this year at a conference organized by the Committee for the Free World that took place on um, February 12th and 13th. And in thinking about the kinds of changes that have occurred in American intellectual life between 1952 and the present, it occurs to me that the refusal of any of the speakers or organizers of the present series to acknowledge that this question was extensively explored by distinguished series of intellectuals uh, earlier this same year, uh, itself signifies the kind of decline in intellectual civility which has overtaken American intellectual life in the last 30 years. After all, that uh, event 
earlier on was written about by Walter Goodman in the New York Times, by Alfred Kazin in the New York Review of Books, uh, and others. And while the reports were neither comprehensive, sympathetic, nor accurate, uh, it nonetheless did put us on notice that something had occurred. <laughs> what is interesting uh, to me about, what is most interesting to me about the original Partisan Review Symposium was that in, insofar as the word culture was used uh, in the title, Our Country and Our Culture, the word culture was used in a purely political sense to the extent that we uh, nowadays and even uh, in those days use the word culture to refer to the life of literature and the arts. What is amazing to look back upon in the Old Partisan Review Symposium was that there was absolutely nothing central to American cultural life, to American artistic life at that moment, 1952, ever mentioned by a virtually a single contributor to the Partisan Review Symposium. After all, let us try to think back to 1952. It doesn't belong to prehistoric times. Some of us have quite a vivid memory of it. There was in painting uh, the New York School. It was neither new, and entirely new, although the larger art public was perhaps just beginning to familiarize itself with the uh, paintings of the abstract expressionists, but it had been on the scene for just about a decade in 1952. Pictures were already in the museums, they were already in the galleries, they were written about in Life magazine. They were written about extensively in Partisan Review. Not a single artist of the New York School was ever referred to in the original symposium on our country and our culture. There was the New York City Ballet, uh, which had been organized by Lincoln Kirstein, who in uh, his earlier career had been the founder and editor of The Hound and Horn, which was a magazine that I think had a certain, uh, uh, press, uh, set a certain precedent in its literary standards for partisan review, um, and had produced in George Balanchine, the single greatest choreographer uh, of uh, the post uh, Diaghilev, uh, history of ballet, never mentioned. Nor was Martha Graham, nor the Museum of Modern Art, nor any of the poets or novelists uh, then emerging, uh, many of them being published in Partisan Review. Um, I think it was around 1950 or 51 that I first saw Merce Cunningham dance on the stage at the 92nd Street Y. Of course, none of that was in any way uh, figured in the imagination of the contributors to the symposium on our country and our culture in 1952. Nor were the poets of the Lowell, Durrell, Bishop, Berryman, Schwartz, Ritke generation not even by Delmore Schwartz, who was one of the contributors to the symposium. Culture was banned from the symposium on our country and our culture. <laughs> it was a kind of holdover from the, um, I suppose, from the commissar mentality of Marxist intellectuals. The life of art in the United States in 1952 was, for the purposes of that symposium, a complete and utter blank. What was being discussed was politics. And politically, kicking and screaming, a good many uh, left-wing intellectuals had decided that as between Auschwitz and the Soviet gulag, they preferred New York. <laughs> Even so, 
most of what was said about American life in that symposium was either false, uninformed, or evasive. There were exceptions, of course, most notably Lionel Trilling. But by and large, it is absolutely amazing to look back on that symposium, famous as it is, and see how profoundly ignorant these leading intellectuals were of the social and artistic life of the society they presumed to pass judgment upon. Do I exaggerate? Well, let's uh, turn to the contribution of Irving Howe to that symposium. It'll give you some questions to ask him next week. Irving Howe sol solemnly announced in his contribution to that symposium that, quote, America has entered the stage of kitsch, the mass culture of the middle brows. Now, what exactly was he talking about? It's true that as a book reviewer for Time magazine, he was familiar with middle brow journalism. Uh, but I don't think he was speaking autobiographically, unless I mistook him. <laughs> now, years later, as some of us were pleased to see, Mr. Howe discovered the New York City Ballet. He actually wrote uh, an essay for Harper's Magazine in which he declared himself to be a balatomane. Uh, it was, considering some of the other things he had expressed his enthusiasm for, this was a welcome change. <laughs> but what did it mean to talk about kitsch in 1952? I mean, some of us were going to Balanchine's ballets in 1952, so that when um, this belated discovery was made, I believe, in the 60s or maybe early 70s, it seemed kind of quaint to us. Uh, what was being talked about? The exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art? Uh, the exhibitions in the galleries on 57th Street? New York musical life? What was this um, stage of kitsch? Now, when a Marxist uses the word stage, we know that it doesn't mean some incidental um, embellishments of the superstructure. We know it means something central to the society and the culture that is being discussed. But what did it refer to? Uh, Life magazine? Uh, when Will Barrett talked about television just beginning to loom in 1952, I think it's important to recall that when people referred to as they did repeatedly and incessantly in the original Partisan Review Symposium where they referred to mass culture, they weren't for the most part talking about television. They were talking about Life magazine. They were talking about Hollywood. Those same Hollywood movies that they now give you a master's degree at Columbia for studying. <laughs> I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. <laughs> I think it's a terrible thing. But I'm still trying to, f to get into focus exactly what this stage of kitsch was actually referring to. Actually, this whole conception of kitsch taking over society and the arts was not in any way mandated by the high culture of uh, the United States at that particular moment of our history. Because if you were not interested in kitsch, if you were not drawn to it, you could very easily ignore it. And many of us did. And we were rather amazed and somewhat confounded by the fact that so many intellectuals who really couldn't tell one Hollywood movie from another, were always carrying on about it. Until the day we discovered that they had to talk about kitsch because kitsch was mandated by the Marxist conception of capitalist culture. 
and that that's what they were talking about. They were talking about an idea of culture. Uh, and according to Marx's theory, kitsch had to drive out high culture. It could not coexist with it. Well, I think we found out differently. And it is not an exaggeration to say that Marxism still held sway over certain of the contributors to the original symposium, though uh, blessedly not all of them. Uh, Mr. Howe himself declared in his contribution to that symposium, quote, Marxism seems to me the best available method for understanding and making history, unquote. Now, it obviously was not the best method for understanding or making the history of the New York City Ballet. I don't even think it was the best method for making partisan review. And I hope somebody next week uh, will ask Irving uh, about that statement, because he tends at times to be forgetful about the past. <laughs> One of the other uh, issues that loomed very large in the 1952 Partisan Symposium, which I think is of concern to us this evening, is the intensity with which both the editors and certain contributors spoke of what they called the tradition of critical nonconformism in American culture. And what is of particular interest is the way it was rather glibly assumed that this tradition of critical nonconformism was the sole possession of the political left. Now, even then, uh, before um, certain changes took place in American intellectual life, it was a wholly mistaken idea to regard the tradition of critical nonconformism in American culture as being the exclusive possession of the left. One would have to um, um, erase all memory of Henry Adams and Henry James among others, uh, to keep that idea uh, in its pure state. But of the original contributors to the Partisan Review Symposium, I think it was only Joseph Frank who actually uh, uh, expressed uh, a, a his consciousness of the point that Will Barrett uh, mentioned earlier, that uh, so much of the intellectual life of this group had uh, been formed on a critical appreciation of the American classic writers, um, which they found convenient to forget when framing their theories of American culture. Joe Frank remembered in his discussion of Isabel Archer and the Portrait of the Lady, though brief in that symposium, stands as a corrective um, to this uh, very facile notion that critical nonconformism is somehow to be identified with leftist virtue. Delmore Schwartz, too, spoke in the symposium about, quote, the will to conformism, which he uh, felt was, as he said, now the chief prevailing fashion among intellectuals. And this has pretty much become a uh, a received idea about, not only about 1952, but about the 50s generally, that something called conformism was the ch uh, chief prevailing fashion among intellectuals. So we must ask the question again, whom could he have had in mind? Let me mention some names. And let us ask ourselves if some hypothetical will to conformism best characterizes their role in shaping American culture in the 1950s. Saul Bellow, Robert Lowell, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, David Smith, Clement Greenberg, Edwin Denby, George Balanchine, Lincoln Kirstein, Virgil Thompson, 
Theodore Retke, Robert Penn Warren, Eleanor Clark, Lionel Trilling, W.H. Auden, Alfred Barr, Edmund Wilson, even Delmore Schwartz. Are those the names that come to mind when we speak of conformism being the chief prevailing fashion among the intellectuals of the 50s? What on earth was being talked about? What was this culture that was so conformist? Who was creating it? In whose hands did it live or die? It was a myth. It was an invention. And to be perfectly frank, it was a lie. Actually, American intellectual life in the 50s was far less conformist than American intellectual life is today because the kind of leftist piety that was being uh, upheld in that symposium, even ostensibly by people who, were, uh, who saw themselves in the process of rejecting it. They, were reject they thought they were rejecting it, but they retained the language that kept it going. And because they could not give up the idea that the left represented cultural virtue. There was then, and it is something that has grown uh, to catastrophic proportions in our own day, a certain intellectual cowardice and bad faith, a refusal to face the truth, the whole leftist Marxist myth of culture in general and American culture specifically was a lie, that it had no relation to reality. It had no relation to the artistic realities. It was something that was a carryover from political credos that no longer had any meaningful application to the institutions of American political life or the achievements of American, uh, of American art. There was, I think, only one statement in the 1952 Partisan Review Symposium that holds up both for its truth and for its prophecy. And that was uh, Lionel Trilling's. And in one particular detail of Trilling's statement, we have both a prophecy of what has come to pass and a link to what is presently occurring. And that is the statement in which Trilling speaks of the artist in America in relation to its institutions, particularly as he says here to the foundations, the foundations in those days looming uh, large, and the government not yet having a role to play uh, in the cultural life of the nation to any significant extent, at least not a role where money was concerned. But if one applies what Trilling said in 1952 to the present government role in cultural life, I think it will be seen that he was very prophetic indeed. He wrote, quote, our attitude to the artist is deteriorating as our sense of his needs increases. It seems to me that the more we undertake to provide for the artist, the more we incline to think of the artist as postulant or apprentice and the less we think of the artist as master. Indeed, it may be coming to be true that for us, the master is not the artist himself, but as Trilling says, the foundation, or as we might say today, government agencies whose creative act the artist is, unquote. So far have we come 
that there are now, uh, to use an old Marxist term, cadres of intellectuals and bureaucrats who find it impossible to believe that there can be an American culture without the government creating it, without government intervention, without this creative act on the part of the government that the artist will be. There seems to be a kind of amnesia about the fact that the, this government intervention is of recent date, whereas the glories of uh, the arts in America uh, tend, in almost every case, to predate them. So far have we come that today the real issue when we speak about our country and our culture is not are we neglecting the artist, but are we killing him with our interest? Thank you. Thank you, Hilton. I've dutifully uh, copied down the notes for Irving Howe for next week to ask him those questions, but I should say, not in his defense, just say that he's not the only one of us who's had some experience of middle-brow journalism. Oh, I'll, I'm doing that again? Other, other of us have uh, worked in middle-brow journalism, too, including some of us at the table. Yes, but not all of us have attempted to disguise the fact. Um, I do have a couple of questions to pose. It's not fair to ask uh, Mr. Barrett to defend something he wrote 30 years ago. It's certainly not fair to ask Hilton Kramer to defend something that William Barrett wrote 30 years ago. <laughs> However, they did both appear in the symposium that uh, Hilton mentioned, and which I me did mention last week, although not with sufficient deference, perhaps. <laughs> it was called Our Country and Our Culture, and it was uh, put on by the Committee for a Free World. In that uh, meeting, Hilton wrote this, or, said, or he, he wrote it or sent it in because it snowed and you couldn't get there, as I remember. You know. Talking about the left in uh, American intellectual life, he wrote, the conception of culture is so completely hostage to political modes of thought that there is no room in it for the experience of art and the achievements of art. Now, this connection of uh, culture and politics is evident on the left, but wouldn't you say that's evident on the right as well? If you read commentary, you can't uh, miss it uh, each month, it seems to me. For Mr. Barrett, he wrote, also on the question of uh, left and right, In view of the, this uneasy relation between socialism and art, he just uh, written quite a bit about uh, the bad times of the artist in the, the Soviet Union. Uh, and indeed, the virtual extinction of art in the Soviet Union, the political loyalties of a good part of our Western intelligentsia, and particularly that part that has to do with the arts, are highly surprising, to say the least. For these political loyalties are, for the most part, to the left. Why these intellectuals should wish to follow a path that would lead to this suppression, I do not know. He goes on in that vein. But isn't that too easy a connection between having an allegiance to the left, and that can mean many things, and uh, being devoted to the Soviet Union, particularly now? That is, even if you disagree with uh, much of what our leftist intellectuals are saying now, I don't think you can find many of them who are saying a good word for the Soviet Union. In fact, you find their names on manifestos in favor of dissidents all the time. Go. Oh. All right. No, but the question is quite different, Mr. Goodman. Uh, <clears throat> the th what is puzzling is we, we have the historical evidence that art either disappears or is suppressed under a leftist regime, that there's no flourishing of art and so on. Why should Western intellectuals living in a democratic country turn toward the left and who are interested in art, not really being, uh, why should they not be appalled at this and raise the question whether their loyalties should go elsewhere? See what I mean? They don't, they're not troubled by this fact that art, art has not 
flourished under any socialist regime. Quite the contrary. Well, it's tough for me to make I, the argument. May I address now, myself yes. to that remark? Uh, it's true that there are very few American intellectuals today who uh, are willing to come forward and defend the Soviet Union and therefore to right. defend cultural life in the Soviet Union. But uh, one of the misfortunes of recent history is that more and more of the world is now under the, the uh, domination of communist regimes. And as soon as one regime loses its moral prestige, there are many others to take their place. So while you don't find American intellectuals defending uh, the Soviet Union, you find them defending Cuba, or when, when, when the mileage runs out on Cuba, uh, it's uh, Nicaragua, or it's, uh, I mean, there, there are plenty of communist regimes to go around. I mean, after all, it isn't so long ago, it's within the memory of many of us, and a painful memory that it is, that even writers who were very wise about the Soviet Union, like Mary McCarthy, went to Hanoi and were totally hoodwinked by what went on and wrote real lies about it. Uh, so it's not a question of defending the Soviet Union. It's a question of that absolute refusal to give up the idea that there's, there's this leftist ideology laid up in heaven that commands our allegiance, if you're an intellectual. And unfortunately, in the world in which we live, there are an infinite number of communist regimes for them to latch on to as soon as each one loses its moral prestige. The, we, uh, uh, it would be wonderful to say we were running out of them, but we're not. Well, would either of you address yourself to the question I asked you that? Um, <laughs> Which was the, that? The one about the, the fact that there are right-wing regimes that are unsavory, that right-wing intellectuals... Yeah, but who defends their culture? Is that no. the issue? Well, is, I, that, is that what we're talking about? No. no you, de, you defend... Go ahead, go ahead. You defend the politically... You defend polit... Not you. But uh, those who attack the left-wing regimes and say that... And say correctly that they're repressive. In my view, they're repressive and there'll be others are very quiet about what goes on in the right. No, and whether, no really? not true. Not real. No. No. I, I don't remember reading any not attacks on Reagan Somoza. The administration is quiet about, you know what, and, you know, this satis dissatisfaction. Well, you'll have to, you'll have to cite some... Uh, are you suggesting that, this, that these can be equated? I don't recall that... Um, you know, that Somoza, the Somoza regime exactly enlisted the allegiance of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of American intellectuals, say, the way Castro did. I think I that's mean, true. I uh, mean, nobody could even spell his name. I think that's true. Come but on I, now. But it's extraordinary that on the right, all the animus occurs not because of anything that Somoza did or any of the other uh, right-wing dictators. The animus comes up only when the left uh, appears. I mean, no. that's unwholesome. No, it's not true, but it, uh, but, true. But it probably, I mean, probably our impression is formed on the fact that so many more lies are told on the left. That is, they're so much more articulate about these matters, and they command so many more publications. And I, 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 could I make one point here? I think what, what occurred, you see, in, in Western thinking about politics was a sub a substitution of rhetoric for thinking. That is, if you, I'm, I'm going to sound like a professor for a moment, please forgive me. Uh, if you think of, let's say, classical political thinkers, and I'm talking about people like Aristotle and so on, uh, who are not rhetoricians when they're doing politics anyway, there's an awareness of the give and take of certain political situations. With the I'm, 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 I'm addressing myself now to a, a particular question. You see, ask, what is wrong with the left? Now, I spent most of my life growing up as a young leftist and I was good intellectual discipline. I understand certain things about the Soviet Union because I was a passionate Leninist at the age of 15. 
and I understand them in a way in which a lot of people don't. And it took me a long time to extricate myself step by step by step from that dogma, that peculiar kind of mixture of mythology and pseudoscience which has been woven into Marxism. Now, this hasn't been gone through with that most of our intellectuals are still quasi-Marxist. And there I think Hilden is probably quite right. I would agree with him, moderate his polemicism a little bit. He's a much uh, more aggressive guy than I am. But anyway, <laughs> look, let's get back. The fundamental, you know, it's reported that audiences coming out of the movie Reds. You remember that? It's, where, yeah, Reds. And I said, when did that go wrong? They're talking about that. Imagine that was in 1952. I thought, oi, Gaval. You know, I mean, and so I, I ran and said to someone who was not, this is going out of the theater, you know, and I said, about 200 years ago with the French Revolution. <laughs> The substitution for a rhetoric, empty conception started with the intellectuals of the French Revolution. And it's been going at it since. I mean, the, you, you've got a, a machinery of rhetoric that the left pumps up every particular time. Now, Mr. Goodman, this, what about the right? Hey. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Well, they're not so smart either. I mean, <laughs> Good, I mean, you get the same sense of cli cliches, but at least they have some awareness that somewhere in a society, you have to be rooted in more than rhetorical abstractions. Sometimes they do. For example, for example, let's put it this way. If you have a society, it, it, is, it is such an incredible miracle that you can have a human society which is even moderately okay in a half-assed way, as ours is. That's a miracle. You hold on to it. You ask about it and how, how you can improve it. The notion that you can wipe, wipe slate clean and plunge into remaking a whole society. What? I mean, this was something that's the ancients who watched politics closely in small city-states where they could see how little groups and little societies, little city-states were made. I said, my God, these, these, these people with all their mastery of physical society, of physical sciences, I'm a sugar when it comes to, you know, to a, a political savvy. It's just simply that the thinking about politics from the end of the 18th through the 19th century into the 20th just went awry. It lacked depth, it lacked solidity, it lacked modulation. And this is what the, the intellectual situation we've been living with. Enough of a tirade. Well, Unaccustomed as I am to defending the left, um, <laughs> one can uh, look at the left and see that uh, at least their passions are stirred by inequality, and they're troubled by uh, people who don't have enough to eat, and they're worried about uh, social conditions. Now, you look at the right, and you don't find very much of that. You really don't. You don't uh, read much in uh, the things that uh, my friends write here on those subjects. Now, is it unworthy? I mean, shouldn't, wouldn't it be more wholesome for the right, having already proved that they don't like the Soviet Union, a large and courageous uh, action now, uh, to, to be concerned about the things that are happening in our own society and not writing every action of the left off as being still in thrall to a, yeah. a, a dream that I think very few people share today. Well, Walter, actually the truth is that you're quite accustomed to defending the left. <laughs> and your, your whole notion of conducting uh, a fair uh, account of what goes on in any intellectual or political forum as your report on the Committee for the Free World Conference on Our Country or Our Culture demonstrated was to always um, say, well, when have you stopped beating your wife? 
I mean, that is, that's more or less your stance. That is, even-handedness consists of giving equal time to truth and falsehood. Um, now, we would have to, we'd have to go into a very sizable literature on the relationship between liberty and equality to talk about the role, the discussion of poverty in conservative political thought. Uh, and it's my impression that that is not the discussion, the subject on the discussion this evening. And what I'm curious about is why, when the criticisms have been so sharply made of the original Partisan Review Symposium as an exemplification of the illusions of the intellectual left about both our country and our culture, we suddenly find ourselves talking about uh, what the right does or does not write about poor people. Now, uh, that is not, um, uh, that really doesn't address itself to the issues that have been raised earlier this evening. Mm -hmm. Seems could, relevant to me, but all right. No, we could go into a whole critique of, of uh, relief organizations and what is really done to alleviate poverty, which is usually turned down, you know, half of the funds are mm, pretty, pretty much half goes into the bureaucratic administration of the relief agencies. There have to be better ways of doing it. See what I mean? But I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not a partisan, particularly the right. Well, why not? Well, what's your great antipathy toward the center? I am, I am the center. Well, all right. Well, then exemplify it. Okay. Yes, if you are the center, you've managed to disguise the matter profoundly. And not just this evening. <laughs> well, let's go back to the question of uh, why the intellectuals were so wrong. You're suggesting they were so wrong because they were captured by a, uh, a leftist mythology, if I understand. Yes. That's right. Now, has there been no change, in your view, in the, uh, in, among leftist intellectuals, among intellectuals, most of whom are left, uh, I think we'd agree, Today, I mean, do you really believe? Oh, yes, I think there has been a change. Well, why don't you tell us? I about think that. there has been a significant change, and all for the worse. <laughs> that is, in 1952, one could say of the most respectable leftist intellectuals that they were deeply divided. They put their cultural interests in one pocket and their political interests in another pocket. And while Partisan Review, in particular, uh, established its fame and influence by pretending to yoke these into a unified point of view, actually they remain profoundly divided. There was no way to unify mo modernism in the arts with Marxism and, po and political ideology. It was, it, it, was a, it was an extraordinary hat trick on the part of Philip Rav to have been able to pull that off. And he even, uh, he was only no, able to pull it off because so he well. believed it himself for a while. Yeah, but, no, that was, uh, uh, but what has happened since is that most of the, most intellectuals on the left today are no longer divided. They sacrifice everything to their political beliefs. And you can see that by what's happened in their journals. Uh, take The Nation. The Nation once had an extraordinary succession of art critics. Uh, Clement Greenberg, most notably, Fairfield Porter, uh, Max Kozloff, uh, Lawrence Alloway, myself. Uh, they don't have an art critic today because they're not interested in art. They're only interest in, they're interested in political agitation. And the classic division on the left for many years, it was in the division of the nation in the days when Frieda Kirchway was the editor, Margaret Marshall was the literary editor, that is the front of the book was Stalinist, the back of the book was whatever its politics, it had a kind of free critical uh, reign where intelligence often triumphed, it was the same in the New Statesman when Kingsley Martin ran the front of the magazine as uh, Stalinist enterprise and Raymond Mortimer ran the back of the magazine as a kind of uh, form of Bloomsbury aestheticism, that's all gone. Now it's totally unified and culture has been sacrificed to politics. I prefer not to take the nation, 
Um, but there are other uh, there are other left wing publications. I mean, the Republic is not uh, of that sort. And it's they don't have an art critic know. either. <laughs> well, so we got an art. I mean, it's not the, the only nation criteria. wouldn't think that the New Republic you, was left wing. No, but that's an argument on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the New Republic is sort of like Walter. I mean, it My wants man. to be all things to all men <laughs> while remaining on the left. I'm so glad I could be here with you tonight. <laughs> well, to get back into history, uh, when Hilton mentioned uh, uh, the Partisan Review's effort to merge uh, modernist uh, uh, art with Marxist uh, politics, you said it wasn't. It wasn't Philip Roth doing that. You, you, you uh, he wasn't the only more. one. No, that was that was a, the whole goddamn cliche, you know, of the European intellect. Take somebody like Sartre. Take Picasso himself. He thought, him, you know, those doves of those awful doves that he painted at the end of his life. He, he thought, if you are if you are free spirit in art, then you're free spirit in politics. And free spirit meant God save the mark. It meant being a communist. There's somehow they could never put two and two together to see what, you know, and this led to in the Soviet Union. But I don't know whether we should. It's like, I, I, I imagine that people should know this by this time. It's like flogging a dead horse. Uh, it isn't dead, Will, I'm afraid. No, I, it's true. It isn't dead, but it ought to be dead here. Max, so dead that you can, it stinks out the joint. Well, you I'm see, sorry. that's, 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 but I mean, that's, that's really in a way how you know who your friends are. They have better nostrils than other people. <laughs> that would, well, anyway. We have some questions up while I go through them. Uh, let me ask you, Hilton, is it wholesome and necessary that the division be as stark as you make it? You no, think I think, oh, I think it's terrible that the division is as stark as it is, but I'm just describing it. Do you think so? Oh, absolutely. If anything, well, I'm understating it. Uh, I mean, I'm basically a very gentle person, and I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make this as uh, assimilable as it's possible for it to be to a gentle audience. Well, we have a question for you, Hilton. Uh, could you be more specific? Name, perhaps, the names of some artists who have been destroyed by government largesse. Well, um, <laughs> that, if I may say so, is really not quite the way it works. That is, um, the artists who are going to be destroyed by government largesse are the ones we haven't heard of yet. Uh, exactly, uh, was something I had meant to bring in and I forgot. A couple of days ago, no, about a week ago, I got a letter from an official in NASA, National Air or, or Aeronautics and Space, and I couldn't, I was puzzled by it. It was about opportunities, artistic opportunities in space. <laughs> Oh, why would they have to? And I was puzzled. I, I read the letter. I, I should have brought it. I, I read the letter aloud, you know, a couple of people. One was a young lady who has recently had her junior year in France. And she said, well, I guess they're ready. They're preparing to launch a program. Your junior year in space. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you will get scholarships. I'm just, not, <laughs> This would be a case, you see, where we, government would kill us with its kindness. We have a question for you. Okay. How did your generation, which you call the New York Radical Group, become the neoconservatives of the 80s? Oh, and only a few of them became. And those were the ones who were thought out about the politics. First of all, I dislike the word neoconservative, but all right. Uh, it's a factual identification by this time. They were the persistent ones who thought through the question to the end. And the question is very simple. It has to do, if you want to put this question of the person coming out of the movie Reds, where did the Russian Revolution go wrong? 
Was it a capricious thing, you know, that Stalin sees it? The point is, no. It, it follows this inherent pattern, you see, if you have a regime which takes over the complete economy. Do you know what, realize the amount of regulations you need to regulate even a tiny segment of the, of the economy? First of all, it's insane to attempt it, but, but it, it, it involves really, necessarily, a whole bureaucratic a apparatus, top, 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 one on top of the other. And there's no escape from it. And that in some sense, you have to really just forsake the whole, the whole Marxist ideology. This, I think, is where some of us have decided, well, you got to accept this awful label of being called a neoconservative, which isn't so bad once you get there. <laughs> Do you mind being called neoconservative? <laughs> Not at all. I've been called much worse. Uh, this is addressed to Mr. Barrett, but perhaps both of you might like to uh, talk about it. Are democratic institutions really tied in with capitalism? Is this true in Mitterrand's France and Labour Party Britain or Sweden? Why do totalitarian left-wing regimes always have to be the example? Well, well can I have to see the First of all, it's not signed. No, 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 no. No, I just have to remember. You forget you took me to the, oh, you, you went to the and so on. First of all, Mitterrand's France. Ah, that's a, it's a capitalist country. You mean because he's, he, he's elected, he's, he's a member of the Socialist Party? That's, a, that's like, you know, the Democrats. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a capitalist country. The Labour Party in Britain. Well, they're not in power now. But Britain is a capitalist country, and even when the Labour Party was in power, it was a capitalist country. It was a question there of what becomes here with enlarging the, the question of the welfare state. But that's quite different. The welfare state plus capitalism is a very different thing from having literally socialism. In Sweden, the same thing. I mean, they've had various struggles back and forth about the extent of the of the welfare state and the benefits of the society and they cut back on some and so on, just like here would be if we continue. Why do totalitarian left-wing regimes always, always have to be the example? Well, I was using, <laughs> I, 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 I don't say, I, I was using totalitarian left-wing regimes to say this is what socialism leads to if you follow it literally to the end of the road. That's all. Uh, on, I think there's, there's something interesting to discuss in this question that actually does have a bearing upon the, the subject of the evening, and that is the tendency of uh, socialist or collectivist bureaucracies to exert a degree of control over cultural life. Mm. And to the extent that the um, many governments in Europe um, have moved leftward, no matter what government is in power at the moment, they have so vastly increased the role of government in the cultural life that it becomes almost uh, unthinkable for certain artists and writers and cultural institutions to imagine that there's any alternative to making any cultural initiatives apart from the government. Um, and it didn't start under Mitterrand, though it certainly has been increased. This is the role of, of government power, the role of government decision making in the cultural life of France, for example has increased tremendously under Mitterrand, but it did not begin under Mitterrand. I remember a, a French uh, intellectual visiting New York recently pointed out that it was uh, André Malraux who really began the Maison de la Culture uh, system in France uh, under, uh, under de Gaulle. And he quoted a friend of his as saying, I think really quite wonderfully, he said the, uh, the Maison de la Culture, the uh, House of Culture, is what intellectuals remember when they've forgotten their Bolshevism. 
that's the kind of residue of Bolshevism under a democracy. That is, even if you can't control every piece of legislation, you can still control culture and try to initiate any kind of serious exhibition, theatrical production, musical production uh, in France without the government's approval, you're dead. There is no life of cultural institutions in, in, the, in a country like France without the government. And the more uh, control the central government exerts over the economy and over political life, the more control over culture there is. And we see it happening in France today. That's what all that smokescreen by uh, Jack Lang, the French culture minister, is all about with his denunciations of Dallas as cultural imperialism, while his own French government television station is paying enormous fees to broadcast it on French television. Uh, it's, I mean, that's what it's all about. The uh, government will control. Uh, thank God we're not there yet, but the whole uh, tendency in this country of, of arts administrators to want the government to play a larger and larger role means they want the government to play a larger and larger role in controlling. Was there a way, Hilton, for, to get the money from the government without the power coming uh, with it? It's never been discovered. <laughs> and it's not likely to be. Then what, then what is the choice? Then, what, then one doesn't take the money. Well, you know, the endowments only go back to 1965, mm -hmm. and we did have an American culture before that. <laughs> you know, we did have the Museum of Modern Art, we did have the New York School, we did have Wallace Stevens and a few other poets. I mean, we did have an American culture. We had the New York Philharmonic, we had uh, opera houses, we had writers, musicians, artists. Uh, before 1965. American no. culture didn't begin in 1965. No, but it's possible that the endowments have helped people. I mean, is it really impossible? And it's possible they've done the, the reverse. Okay. <laughs> uh, final question. It seems that in the 50s there was a sudden awareness of the preeminence of American culture, not because of its sudden flowering, but rather because of an acknowledgement of relative cultural bareness of post-war Europe. Some of us might finally be ready to, re to discover American culture and achievement and its own achievements, not necessarily in relation to left, right, left or right political dimension. What he's saying, I think, or it's not really much of a question, but I think there's a question there. Is it possible to think about uh, art? I mean, from our conversation, it hasn't been. Is it possible to think about culture in a way that uh, moves away from the political dimension? Or are they so intertwined now that it makes no sense to talk about it that way at all? Well, oddly enough, um, one of the purposes uh, of um, launching a journal like the New Criterion, if I may speak about that for a moment, was precisely to do battle for, to to e eliminate the political interpretation of the arts. And of course, as, as soon as you say that, the, the automatic response is, but aren't you being political and attempting to eliminate the political interpretation of art? Well, I suppose it's true to some degree, but the, 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 the uh, shackle, the, the stranglehold that po political ideology has had on the interpretation of art has, has become so advanced that there is no possibility of liberating art from, uh, the, from political, um, uh, from political interpretation without doing battle over it. I think that finally the highest art is beyond political interpretation. But one of the tragedies of our cultural life today is that the arts have been annexed to political institutions and political ideologies. And, to, and my profoundest conviction is that it's the task of criticism, it's the task of intellectuals today, is to liberate the arts, to help to liberate the arts from those political shackles. You have a final comment on that, Bill?
I think I have to agree with Hilton. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, you see, there's a, the, the real, real crunch, why, why is socialism antipathetic toward the arts? And I, I'll put it this way. This is, I'm going to leave it because I gather this is a wind-up, right? Sure. <laughs> then I don't have to pursue the thought. I'll just throw it out. Art by its very nature, you see, is a, enters another region. It, it doesn't matter how simple it is. A simple poem, beyond what I might call objective social reality. When I think of the travesties of criticism that I saw my Marxist friends, or that I myself perpetrated in my youth, you know, in our thinking and our discussing, this work of art shows this and that. Bourgeois. The, the point is that a, a simple human being writing a lyric in which, may, may I use the word soul, his soul is afflicted and he pleads, that's beyond the political ideology. It transcends it. It's another region and so forth. And this is through is true, I think, of all the arts, they pass into another dimension. The dimension of social reality and social management, which is the same thing, belongs elsewhere, and it is not the all-encompassing reality, you see, which, which the uh, leftist ideology have made out. It's just one of the, one of the aspects of our communal, our social existence which we have to manage as best the way we will. And the point about a society and dealing with and managing it is that so much of it is so goddamn prosaic and nitty gritty. And it's the very absence, you know, of, of, of rhetoric, high rhetoric, and lots of that dizzy, dizzy dance of concepts and so on. Somebody like Trotsky used to fling out. Managing a society is plodding, pedestrian, and so on. But an artistic expression belongs to an absolutely other dimension of reality. And that's what I'm afraid of, that that dimension of reality might be lost by, by modern individuals. Because our society, in a way, drifts away from it. It's, it drifts in a direction of, shall I say, technological management and so on. But this is not the evil of America. This may be the particular crisis which is developing for all of Western civilization. OK? I, I agree with everything I've heard for the last two minutes. <laughs> Next week, we have the left wing. Thank you, Hilton, Will, and everyone. Good night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.